morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Do put where you are in the world and say hello to your friends on this on this wonderful webinar in the chat if you'd like to. We'd love to know where you're from. Also, if this is your very first time uh, on an MMA webinar, do put up your hand if you're if this is your first Mind Medicine Australia webinar. Few people, not many, but some of you, yes. And welcome back to all those who've been with us before on, on our many webinars. This is the second of our global webinar series for 2024. We started off with Wade Davis. Uh, some of you all have seen in, in February, which was wonderful. And today we have the extraordinary Bill Richards with us, which is just such a blessing. And um, to begin with, I would like to acknowledge all of the unique human beings on this call. All of you are part of our collective humanity. We acknowledge the wisdom and light keepers and medicine keepers whose shoulders we stand on and the ancient wisdom from a range of traditions that helps us to heal, raise our consciousness, connect to ourselves and one another and remember what a special planet and place we are part of. So today, wow, look at all the different places you're from. Let's see now. We have London, Sydney, Canberra, Texas, Byron Bay, Albury, Palmerston, North New Zealand, Bali. Wow, Bill, this is truly international today. <laughs> Hobart, Western Australia, Gold Coast, Vancouver, Tambourine Mountain, Gamaragul Land, Santa Cruz, California, Yarra Junction, Rosedale. Oh, oh, oh. And Paul, I'm glad that you love the acknowledgement of humanity. I decided that that was those kind of acknowledgements that I feel that we want to be making in this world today, an acknowledgement of all of our traditions and, and backgrounds. So thank you that you enjoyed that. It was the very first time that um, I decided to, to use that and going forwards, we hope to use beautiful acknowledgements. And if you feel like adding anything to our acknowledgements, we're always open to some creative brainstorming. So we're going to just show you a few introductory slides now on Mind Medicine Australia and the work that we're doing and just where we're at in Australia, which is extremely exciting where we're at in Australia, uh, because we're now in treating patients. I'm, I'm not personally treating patients, but psychiatrists and therapists who we're training in our certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies, which Bill is one of the key teachers on our faculty. Some of those therapists are currently treating patients in clinical environments in Australia, in Melbourne, which is incredibly exciting because they are the first psychiatrists and therapists who are treating patients in a clinical environment in over 50 years. So that's very exciting. And we are hearing wonderful feedback from those psychiatrists. Some of them describe one day of therapy is equivalent to one year of therapy. And we also had one of the clinicians who's treating a patient, I think in Western Australia, where uh, treatments are also taking place in clinics that there was a lady who was afraid to, to go on a bus um, she she was afraid really to go out of her house and then she had the treatment and the next week she she took a bus and that just happened in the last couple of weeks. So there's some pretty miraculous uh, transformations of he and healing occurring and we're so blessed that we can achieve this in Australia and we are very thrilled that this is inspiring other nations to now start to really fast track um, accessibility and affordability of these treatments. So Alan, if you could pop the slides on, that'd be marvellous. I'm joined here today, not only by the incredible Bill Richards, but by Scott Edwards, who's our Executive Officer and Alan Heyman, our Operations Manager, and they will be managing the chat. We encourage you to put questions on the chat and we will try to get through as many of those Bill and I, uh, once Bill's spoken about his wonderful strata status of consciousness today, 
and um, just encourage you to keep your cameras on where you can so that Bill can see your lovely smiling faces. And um, Ilan, have we got those slides? Wonderful. So today is again called the Strata of States of Consciousness, Dr. Bill Richards, US. And we'll go to the next slide. Thank you, Alan. So just a reminder um, that we are completely um, a religious, well, multicultural, multi-faith. We include everyone and we focus on the clinical use of these treatments. Um, rather than the unlawful use recreationally. Our presentations are educational. Uh, they are recorded. And um, we encourage all of you to encourage your friends to join our webinar series going forwards because we do have an extraordinary lineup, which I'll talk about in a moment. Next slide. So in Australia right now, and this is paralleled by a lot of other Western nations around the world, sadly, we have one in four Australians with a mental illness, one in six now on antidepressants, 95% increase in antidepressant use in the last 15 years, children as young as four being given antidepressants, and one in four older people over the age of 55 who are on antidepressants. This is enormous cost to human life and potential, and the cost to society and governments, of course, is, is enormous. But the biggest thing is the human suffering. And it's not about the <clears throat> care or passion of clinicians. This is really um, just because the treatments that have been available up till now are just not good enough. And we acknowledge all of you on this call who are clinicians and therapists for your enormous care uh, for your patients. Next slide. The elephant in the room is the lack of innovation and treatments for mental illness. You can see there the elephant's trying to get the attention of the bureaucrats and saying the current treatments aren't working. Next slide, thank you. And there's been no improvement in treatment outcomes over the past 50 years. Only 15% of sufferers experience actual remission from antidepressants or psychotherapy if they're suffering from depression. And of course, the relapse rates are very high. The side effects are high. In the case of post-traumatic stress disorder, remission rates are as low as 5%. So clearly more of the same is not going to solve this increasing problem. And the problem is increasing because unfortunately we have increasing division and conflict in our world and many people feel separate, alone and isolated, unrutted in a world that is rapidly accelerating in different ways that we can't predict. Next slide, thank you. So we're a mental health charity focused on alleviating suffering and increasing the treatment options available to doctors and their patients with a whole of system approach. At the moment, we're focused on psilocybin and MDMA, though we do teach about ketamine uh, and other substances in our CPAT, Certificate in Psychedelic Assisted Therapies training program. For us, success means that these treatments become an integral part of our mental health system that they're accessible and affordable to all Australians and that they achieve the extraordinary remission rates that they've been achieving in trials around the world. And those remission rates are 60 to 80% after just two to three medicinal sessions with a short course of psychotherapy. So a lot more people could be getting well. Next slide, thank you. So the thing about these medicines is they only require two to three dose sessions in contrast to conventional treatments. They're curative, not palliative. So in actual fact, we're seeing patients getting well, being able to lead meaningful contributing lives, not continually having to manage a medical condition or a life sentence of mental illness. They don't have to take daily pills anymore and they don't have to necessarily go to therapy every week. Strong safety results as well in these trials with no evidence of addiction. Both medicines have been granted breakthrough therapy designation, which is a designation given by the FDA only rarely to medicines that 
could be vastly superior to existing treatments to fast track the approval process. Next slide, thank you. So how does it work? Um, Bill, are you going to talk about these circles at all today or not? Uh, not the psychopharmacology, no. Okay, I might just briefly mention it. So um, the remarkable thing about psilocybin in particular and, and some of the other psychedelics is that they alter communication between brain networks and increase the neural connectivity of the brain and the neuroplasticity of the brain through bypassing what is called our default mode network, which keeps us defaulting and stuck in rigid thought patterns, often from early childhood and other traumas. So we keep going back to those traumatic events or basically not moving on with our life. The, the past keeps coming into the present and enabling, unfortunately, enabling us to, to have very stuck thought patterns that maybe I'm not good enough, things won't work out. Uh, my life is really not worth living and so on. And you can see on the right circle here what happens often through our lives. We are sort of thought loops and, and our brain connectivity becomes more and more limited. On the left, you can see that circle there with the ingestion of the psilocybin, this massive neurogenesis that's occurring. And interestingly enough, in both these circles, which represent fMRI scans, the number of dots and the number of lines are the same. It's just one brain is really functioning in an incredibly connected way. And it's from that particular brain that a trained therapist can work with a patient to really help them to fast track their healing. And the patient becomes an agent for their own healing. They become much more empowered to heal and to set new patterns of behavior, more healthy patterns of behavior to make necessary changes in their lives. It might be their relationships, their work, their living situation, so that they can actually heal and go into remission more quickly. Next slide, thank you. So what is MMA doing? We're building the ecosystem so that these treatments can become available more quickly in Australia. And we do that through four strategic pillars. One is awareness and knowledge building, and that's what this webinar is about and all of our webinar series and public events and external facing events. We're focused on the science and data and we encourage you to, to join all our events. We also, of course, train hundreds of therapists and clinicians through our certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies, which features a world leading faculty, including Bill Richards, who you're meeting today and many of the people presenting on our webinar series like People like Rick Doblin and Gabor Maché and Professor David Nutt and Dr. Bessel van der Kolk and, and many others, many extraordinary teachers. Our current intake, which commenced a couple of weeks ago, is full and is going very well. And our next intake start in Scott, July. Is that right? I think in July. In July, and we're currently taking registrations for the July intakes, which is which are filling very fast. It's a fourteen week part time program, and there's a six day uh, intensive retreat, which is always highly regarded, where the clinicians all get to meet one another and form multidisciplinary teams. It's very exciting to see what's happening between all of the graduates of this course as well. We're also focused on supporting research. We're currently supporting uh, four trials in Australia. We help secure $15 million in funding towards trials and further research and development in Australia, which is the largest federal grant ever granted by federal government to date. And of course, Mind Medicine Australia was the charity which led the rescheduling applications to the Therapeutic Goods Administration, which made Australia the first country in the world to reschedule psilocybin and MDMA a year ago, and that has led to these first patients being treated. We're also very focused on cost-effective medicines. So we have a deal with a, a Canadian company to keep the costs down, and we're focused on helping clinics uh, starting to um, really accelerate uh, the amount of patients that they can support. We've also started a patient support fund. And as a charity, we encourage you to support this fund. The fund, all donations to this fund go 
to supporting patients who otherwise couldn't afford the upfront costs of these treatments. And we thank all of you who are already contributing to that. Whilst Peter and I are philanthropists, we can't possibly do this alone. And many of you on this call and uh, many of the new people too join us and, and help support. So whether you're a small or large philanthropist, it could just be one or two cups of coffee a week that you that maybe you forego so that you can help someone less fortunate than yourself to access these treatments. Next slide, thank you. And this is the the uh, world first that, that we did achieve. Uh, so Australia did become the first nation to reschedule psilocybin and MDMA as controlled medicines so that they can now be used in specific protocols to treat treatment-resistant patients with depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. Next slide, thank you. So if this is our free webinar series, our next one, Dr. Ron Siegel, then Alberto Villoldo, David Nutt, Terza Firestone, Jim Fadiman, and there's more to come, Robin Carhart-Harris later in the year as well. Next slide. And this is about our certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies. And we have applications open to psychiatrists, GPs, and other medical specialists like emergency doctors and palliative care physicians psychologists, psychotherapists, counsellors, nurses, social workers, occupational therapists, other registered allied health professionals, and some complementary medical practitioners. Um, by the end of this year, we will have had 500 graduates. So it's very exciting to see what's happening. Next slide, thank you. These are some of the other extraordinary teachers. Next slide. And often we're asked how people can help us. So apply for the training, attend our events, talk to your local politicians, because there's still more work to be done in Australia. Uh, at the moment, we're working uh, on making sure that the New South Wales government uh, stops insisting that these treatments take place in mental health hospitals, which has currently meant that all New South Wales patients having these treatments have had to travel to either Melbourne or Queensland to have these treatments, which is quite ridiculous. And of course, support us in any way you can. Fundraise, donate, you know, you can name us as your charity of choice for your work, lunches or, or dinners or special events. We'd really be grateful for any ways you can support the charity. And also if you need a webinar or would like to have a special educational session about psychedelic assisted therapies, please reach out to us and we'll make sure that we can deliver something to your community. Next slide. Donation support, uh, financial assistance towards practitioner professional development because some practitioners cannot afford the training if they're working in as high needs areas. And then, of course, our patient support fund and a whole range of other things. Next slide. And we also have wonderful gift cards, mushroom gift cards designed by my niece. We have Australia's first book of psychedelic healing stories. We have T-shirts and more. Thank you. And we'll take the slide sharing off now. And, of course, Dr. Bill Richards. Scotty, would you like to introduce Dr. Bill? Um, sure. I'm happy to. Okay. All right, that'd be marvelous. Um, uh, hi, everyone. And just to say a few words to introduce Bill. Um, uh, we're so pleased to have Bill with us today. Um, he has been um, such an important figure in this space. Uh, and as he mentioned in the session he did recently, uh, he did recently for our CPAT students back when he started his career and he was working in Germany. Um, these This was before these substances became stigmatized or illegal at all. Um, and then he weathered the storm and then was one of the very first uh, healthcare professionals working with them again uh, as he led the psychedelic center at Johns Hopkins University with Roland Griffiths as they, the two of them, uh, plus a couple of others, got that started again and has really been a leading figure in psilocybin research since then. Um, and so we're extremely grateful to have him here sh sharing his depth of wisdom. Um, and with no further ado, I'll say thank you, Bill, and I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. It's good to be with you, all of you. I so admire what's happening in Australia. And all of you are on the verge of really having legal access to using these substances in treatment. It's 
uh, I've been working in research for decades and, you know, research always limits the dosage and the number of hours of contact and the number of sessions and so on. And the thought that uh, they could be used with clinical judgment to tailor a therapy for a particular person, it sounds just too good to be true. And you're already there. And, uh, and my friend Paul Knightsky is also at work in your wonderful country and is um, moving ahead. So it's thank you for leading the way. You are in the future. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> quite literally, it's still uh, the prior evening here in the the U.S. You're already <laughs> the new day, so uh, please keep leading the way. Okay, I want to start with a quote from that uh, Harvard professor at the turn of the 20th century who was going around... Uh, experimenting with nitrous oxide and writing about his alternate states of consciousness, William James. Um, a brief quote here. Uh, he says, our normal waking consciousness, rational consciousness as we call it, that's where most of us are right now, is but one special type of consciousness. While all of about it, parted from it by the filmiest of screens, there lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different. We may go through life without suspecting their existence, but apply the requisite stimulus and at a touch, they are there in all their completeness. Definite types of mentality, which probably somewhere have their field of application and adaptation, no account of the universe in its totality can be final, which leaves these other forms of consciousness quite disregarded. How to regard them is the question, for they are so discontinuous with ordinary consciousness. Yet they may determine attitudes, though they cannot furnish formulas, and open a region, though they fail to give a map at any forbid a premature closing of our accounts with reality. Now, in our limited time, <laughs> I want to say this evening, but it's really this afternoon, I guess. Um, I want to survey, as I've been asked to, these different strata of consciousness and then give some thought to the science and art of navigating safely and effectively in these internal worlds. Uh, I think most of you, probably all of you know that there is no such thing as the psychedelic experience, just as there's no such thing as the meditative experience or the sensory isolation experience, the holotropic breathwork experience, whatever. There are many incredibly fascinating varieties of alternative states of human consciousness. And um, I think the psychedelics are especially valuable because of their potency and their reliability and their safety when they're used wisely. But they are not the only tools to access these inner worlds. Some people experience alternative states spontaneously. Some uh, fortunate women encounter them in natural childbirth. Um, they occur in different types of meditative uh, disciplines, sensory isolation, sensory flooding, uh, in the midst of creative performance, uh, in the runner's high. You know, if you think in your own lives, each of you, probably you can remember some unusually meaningful states of consciousness that you have known. And they may have happened with psychedelics, they may have happened without psychedelics. Um, 
but psychedelics kind of unlock the door, give access to these inner worlds. I like to think that the, the experiences are not in the drug, they're in the human mind. And the drug gives access to it. Many footnotes here. Um, it opens a door. And what we do when that door is open depends on so-called non-drug variables. Motivation, courage, uh, who you are, your support system, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, let's look at the strata. Clearly with especially low dosage uh, and lack of much preparation, people experience intriguing perceptual changes. The so-called tie-dye t-shirt effect, okay? Maybe amusing, maybe a little scary, but it's not likely to be life transformative. Then with a little more dosage or a little more trust, you get into what we call personal psychodynamic experiences or psychological experiences, kind of what makes up ordinary psychotherapy for most of us. Uh, encountering grief that's been denied and repressed, uh, guilt, anger, uh, interpersonal conflicts, reliving and working through childhood and adult traumas, okay? Uh, this is the stuff of ordinary psychotherapy, and it's wonderful and it's powerful. But the psychedelics in adequate dosage with adequate support, open up realms even deeper beyond that, that we call symbolic archetypal visionary, or that we call mystical, integral, unitive uh, states of consciousness. Um, now, the archetypal you may know Carl Jung, uh, early post-Freudian or colleague of Freud's who went more deeply into the psyche than Freud did. But he talked about the personal unconscious and then the collective unconscious. And the idea is that these visionary and mystical states are within the collective unconscious. They're not, something that's part of us. Um, where'd they come from? I don't know. They don't seem to be uh, related to our experiences in this lifetime from birth to the present. Are they uh, genetically encoded in our DNA? Are they spiritually accessed? And what does that mean? Uh, who knows? Uh, one, this frontier is really a, an incredible frontier in science because science is really bumping into those realms that historically we've called sacred and kind of left for the theologians to deal with. But uh, here we are on the frontiers of science uh, dealing with not only the wonder of them, but the therapeutic potency uh, of many of these states of consciousness. Now, visionary things, experiences, people do experience the Buddha, the Christ, the Greek gods, uh, gods and goddesses, inner landscapes, precious gemstones. Uh, Aldous Huxley has a wonderful essay you may know called, Why Are Precious Stones Precious? And he theorizes that we give these little sparkling uh, rocks uh, to one another at weddings and on special occasions, 
precisely because they remind us of the innate gemstones in the depths of our minds. Uh, that's why we value these little rocks, he suggests. But they happen. People see visions of gemstones, enter into them, into the light, in and through the facets, like going deeper and deeper into a vortex in a mandala. And it leads them to incredibly profound insights and states of knowledge. Now, unitive states are by definition very hard to put into words. So you have to give me a little poetic license to even try here. Um, you know, the uh, Hindu concept of the Atman Brahman unity. The Atman is the drop of water falling from the sky. Brahman is the ocean into which it falls. The ego, our everyday personality, my Bill Richards, your proper name, is that drop of water falling. When it hits the ocean, well, it's still there but it's part of something infinitely larger. So we talk about the death of the ego and then its rebirth as it once again becomes a drop, if you will. Um, unity is usually uh, described as going deeper and deeper in the mind through various so-called dimensions of being whatever they are, until all of a sudden there's this feeling of unity, oneness, belonging, being at home in, in a spiritual world of some kind. Uh, it also happens with open eyes, meditating on a rose or a crystal or an object. And um, if you concentrate long enough, this happens in meditation sometimes with open eyes, there's a sense that ultimately all is one. Everything breaks down into sort of the energy dance, if you will. I think Alfred North Whitehead, the great physicist philosopher, was trying to express that. Uh, it, actual entities, he called them, prehending one another. But the feeling is that everything is ultimately conscious and alive that all the energy of the universe is somehow conscious in those uh, moments. Um, this state is clearly uh, described as beyond time and space and substance. Uh, that's why it's so hard to talk about but it's what religions call eternity, what mathematics would call infinity. And when it happens, it's pretty, pretty awesome. So it also, when this mystical state, and incidentally, footnote here, mystical consciousness is now a scientific term. I mean, you can find it in the Journal of Psychopharmacology, in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease. This isn't uh, kind of a turban person looking at a crystal ball. Uh, this is something that is on the frontiers of science. And when it happens, there's usually intuitive knowledge. And we may be skeptical about that, but the, the intuitive knowledge reported stands up pretty well. There's reliability between people and in different people at different times. You know, and basically we ask, well, okay, what do you know? Well, the reality of God, or if you don't like God, you can put some other noun in there, ultimate reality. 
Edmund Sinnott, the biologist at Yale, used to like to talk about the purpose of properties of protoplasm. <laughs> if you feel better with that, that's fine. But there's something deep within the human psyche that is incredibly, awesomely beautiful, intelligent, inspiring, creative, choose your word. And good atheists and agnostics as well as people from different religious backgrounds keep reporting it and bumping into it. That's one of the amazing sacred things about being a psychedelic therapist is witnessing the discovery of this profound state of consciousness in people who don't expect it or seek it at all. There's also an intuitive insight that relates to the um, interrelatedness of us all. Uh, the Hindus have the concept of the net of Indra, the bejeweled net of Indra. Uh, we used to talk about the brotherhood of man. Since the women's movement, we would now talk about uh, the unity of humankind, I think. But that Within human consciousness, we really are all one family somehow. We're interconnected. And the delusion is that we forget that and we think we're isolated human beings running around scampering on the surface of the planet. So clearly the religious implications of this work are quite uh, profound. The, these transcendental experiences when they occur often include imagery that's very much like Gothic architecture or uh, the domes of a cathedral or a great mosque. And uh, it invites the theory that the architects who built the Gothic cathedrals and the great Islamic mosques and um, uh, temples and synagogues and whatever, were somehow trying to replicate this intuitive spiritual world in this reality. It's interesting that when we go into these spaces, we often feel a certain sense of respect, awesomeness, uh, whether we're part of that particular religion or not. And uh, some would theorize that is because it resonates with something in our very own nervous systems, uh, that there is a sacred dimension within all of us. Deep in this state of consciousness, we call mystical or unitive. There's very positive emotion, joy, love, peace, also playfulness. Um, you may know the end of Dante's Divine Comedy where the last verse is, it is love that moves the sun and other stars. I think Dante must have been one who had mystical experiences, whether they were spontaneous or whether they came from moldy bread or eating mushrooms. Who knows? <laughs> but um, uh, when you read uh, works like uh, Dante, you can sense where he's coming from. Same with the psychologist Abraham Maslow, who never took psychedelics, but had spontaneous experiences as a Jewish mystic that he wrote about. Um, and created the term peak experience, which is just another term for the same thing. Then people always claim that these experiences are ineffable. Uh, our research volunteers always write up a report because they promised they would. But there's always, almost always, a paragraph saying this is a ridiculous assignment. There's no way I can express this in words. Maybe I could express it 
somewhat in music or dance or art, but not in, not in words. They're, it's too limiting. And one part of that is this element of what we call paradoxicality, that when people try to talk about mystical experiences, they say things, well, I died, but I was never so alive. Or the ultimate reality was one, but it contained everything that is. It, it was feminine, but it was masculine. <laughs> you know, and so on. And after a while, you say, why should I even try? It just sounds like I'm speaking nonsense, that I'm contradicting myself. Because in these mystical states, it's always both and, both and, instead of either or. All the philosophical antinomies, it's always both and. And that's pretty hard to express in words. Jeremy Narby says, once you've seen, you can't unsee. And when these experiences happen, whether with psychedelics or spontaneously or in other ways, people typically treasure them as kind of uh, sacred spots within their minds. Um, sometimes they don't share them with anyone else. They're afraid people will think they're schizophrenic or something, but it's one of the most valuable insights that they hold within their minds. Now, there are also what we call bad trips. And they're extremely rare when people are well prepared and in a grounded interpersonal relationship when they receive a psychedelic and have some psychoeducation, which I will talk about in just a minute. Um, what I consider a bad trip is an experience characterized by panic, paranoia, misinterpreting the world, uh, confusion, and that usually occurs when one fights for control or tries to get away from what is emerging in the human mind. Uh, when people are well prepared, it's very, very rare. Now, what influences what type of experience is going to happen? You can give the same dose to the, of the same drug to the same person on different days, and there can be very different experiences that are reported. Okay. Dosage is important. We know from careful research at Hopkins that uh, the average person needs at least 25 milligrams of psilocybin to access transcendental levels of human consciousness. Less than that may trigger some very interesting and helpful uh, personal psychodynamic experiences, but the experience is not likely to be what we might call spiritual. Um, the purity of the substance, uh, We've had the good fortune to work with synthesized psilocybin, so we know the exact dosage and the purity. If you're working with uh, mushrooms, any of t at least 200 species that identified thus far that contain psilocybin on our planet, there are many other variables. How were they grown? How have they been uh, stored? What other chemicals are in this particular species of mushroom, et cetera. Uh, so science likes to work with synthesized substance. The intent of a person who takes psilocybin or any of the major psychedelics is very important. And I think what matters is an openness, a desire, for personal and perhaps spiritual growth or development, uh, to be more healthy, to get at 
the causes the of depression and resolve them and not just to cover them up um and there's knowledge that we can teach people uh, in my book as many of you who know it, it, it i recommend the book if you don't mind me making a plug for it it's called sacred knowledge uh, psychedelics and religious experiences. It's out there in 10 different languages now and growing. Um, but in that book, I, I use the metaphor of downhill skiing. Like if you want to go skiing, it's pretty smart to get some instruction <laughs> about how to steer, how to uh, balance, etc. How to slow down and speed up uh, if you just jump on a pair of skis and head downhill, chances are pretty good you're going to hurt yourself or someone else, okay? The same is true of psychedelics. It's stupid to just throw it in your mouth to see what will happen, you know? You, you need to be prepared. One part of preparation besides have being in a safe container in a trusted, confidential setting is the intent to confront anything that looks threatening as fast as you can, not to try to control it, not to try to run away from it or escape it. Uh, you may know the uh, tradition in the ayahuasca using religions of South America uh, what do you do if you see the giant anaconda serpent? Well, you can guess what's going to happen if you run from it, okay? The introduction to nightmare. No, what you do is you dive into his mouth and look out through his eyes, okay? You become the anaconda. You become your Shakti, your Kundalini, your Elan Vital you become your own psychic energy. Why would you run away from that? But similarly, we talk about the intent in prep preparing people of taking a bright flashlight and going down into the basement of your life, kind of with this attitude, if there's anything down here that's causing my depression or anxiety, darn it, I want to know what it is. This is my mind, after all. I have a right to know, okay? And you take your therapist with you and muster some courage and you shine that spotlight into the darkest corners you can find, okay? But can you sense the power of that intent? You know, I'm willing, I want to get insight. I want to grow. I want to resolve things. And if that's going to take me through some suffering, i.e. all of a sudden, there's all this unresolved grief from 20 years ago that it, I didn't even know was locked up inside of me. I'll tumble through that grief. You know, I'll sort out that psychological distress. Now, that's not a bad trip. That's intensive psychotherapy. Okay. But you have to want it, you have to desire it, you have to have the courage to pursue it. Um, and you also have to turn off the intellect during the action of a psychedelic. You collect experiences and then think about them and put words on them at the end of the day. If you say, stop the world, I have to figure out what's going on, you're going to get into trouble because you're going to be in a different uh, way of experiencing time and things may be happening uh, incredibly rapidly. Okay, concluding here. The importance of integrating whatever insights occur in a psychedelic session. My beloved friend, Houston Smith, great scholar of world religions, uh, 
called attention to the difference between having religious experiences and living religious lives. Uh, insights need to be uh, applied, integrated. You may know the wonderful ox herding uh, series in Zen Buddhism, which is a metaphor for the spiritual life. And it begins searching for meaning, searching for the ox. And then you find the first footprints of the ox. And you follow it and the day comes when you sight it. And then you approach it and you wrestle with it. And the day may even come where you ride upon the ox. And the day may come where there's no ox and no you. There's a unit of consciousness. But then the culmination of the spiritual life in Zen Buddhism is riding the ox from the mountaintop back to the village to chop wood and carry water. Okay. And that's a wonderful metaphor of how these insights we have in alternative states need to be brought back to earth, applied, and we need social support to do that. Uh, people are forming psychedelic societies all over the place, and that's fine. But you know, we do have social structures. We call them churches and synagogues and mosques and temples. <laughs> that are already, already there if they can awaken to begin to accommodate this frontier and provide uh, some support for integration. Now, a final comment, and we'll move to some question and answer and sharing here. Psychedelics are not new. They've been around at least since 1500 BC, uh, probably since the dawn of man. And they have emerged in many cultures and been suppressed, very much like mushrooms, actually. They're there, and then they're gone. And then they pop up, and they're gone. Okay, right now, in our brief lifetimes, we're only here for a hundred years or less. These sacred substances are emerging into what we call Western culture. Uh, I'm not sure what term you use in Australia, <laughs> but uh, they're coming into the mainstream. And the question is, are we evolved enough are we smart enough? Are we respectful and tactful enough, intelligent enough to integrate them wisely into current society in safe and responsible ways? I believe we are, okay? But each of you can contribute to this. We need to educate people. There still are very well-educated people who thinks that psychedelics make deformed babies and make you jump off skyscrapers, okay? Uh, they, they mean well, they just don't know any better, <laughs> you know? Uh, the uh, press back in the 1960s and 1970s was really seriously distorted. And uh, we're just getting over that. And fortunately, the press in recent years has been very responsible and helpful. So that bodes well for the future. Okay, I think that's a good place to pause here and uh, let's enjoy uh, some uh, Q and A. Yeah, well, thank you, Bill. I mean, that was absolutely illuminating and um as always, and I took extensive notes because I just always find you such a, such an insightful presenter, and um, I always learn so much from you uh, every single time I, I listen. 
I guess I have a, a question to to kick off, and that is, in this in in our current state of human civilization, where experiencing some of the worst division and conflict that we've seen in a very long time. And I guess my question is how can how can we use these states of consciousness now? Um, I know that obviously, you know, people having access to these states through psychedelics is is one way of people accessing these states, but quite often people take those substances but then don't do the proper and full integration to really take take out what the medicines are really teaching them. And I guess I'm just wondering how could these treatments really help us in times that are so uncertain and, and where a lot of people feel uh, despair and a sense of hopelessness about the future of human civilization. The big questions. So. Well, yeah, that that's a big philosophical, political question, and there's no simple, simplistic answer. I don't think. I think it boils down to genuinely being true to yourself. Uh, if you feel more like being a compassionate presence in the world. If you see uh, other people from different countries and different backgrounds as really your brothers and sisters, and you value diversity, you're not threatened by it. It's an honor to get to know someone who has a completely different background and heritage than my own. Mm. Um, just living in the world in that frame of mind, I think is helpful. Mm. Um, no, that's that makes a lot of sense um, because often I think what's happening at the moment is that people put someone over there and go, well, they're not like me and I don't want anything to do with them instead of going, I would like to understand that point of view and maybe they'd like to understand mine and we would actually meet in the field and we would start to build understanding between us. That's that's certainly what I wish for, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I'd like to look out of your eyes and I'd like to help you see out of my eyes. And yes, we yes. might, we might uh, arm wrestle a bit, uh, but hopefully we can resolve things without having to kill one another, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you for that. Um, there's a lot of questions here. Scotty, would you like to read out um, a couple of questions to Bill right now? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, perhaps I'll start with I'll start with one that's come in. Um, yes. About sorry, that my chat's just jumped as I was about to read it out. No, um, that's okay. <laughs> are you aware of much research that's being done into um, the therapeutic benefits of mescaline as another medicine um, that hasn't been discussed so much, at least here? Yeah, no, no, frankly, I'm not. I, I have never personally worked with mescaline, though I've known people who have valued their mescaline experiences. Mescaline is so long acting. Um, it it may give access to the same states of consciousness, but it would be pretty exhausting for the usual uh, clinical staff to work with mescaline. Uh, I think psilocybin has a six hour trajectory, uh, an hour and a half after ingestion, you're at the most intense part of the day it's like get down to business and then it terminates gradually but firmly at six hours you're usually back to normal reality and you can go home safely you know lsd uh is a longer day it builds up more gradually uh, it's only around the third to the fifth hour that the most effective therapy usually takes place and then it terminates with this kind of bouncing ball effect. So it's often a, at least an eight-hour day and sometimes a 12-hour day. 
Um, if you have the luxury, why not? But I think for medical use, uh, psilocybin is the place to focus right now. It may be that 5-MeO-DMT uh, can accomplish the same thing even more rapidly, uh, but we don't know that yet. Uh, the um, the transition from the intense transcendental states of consciousness to the everyday world may be very important, I would theorize in terms of integrating, bringing back the treasures from deep within to the everyday world and just zapping in and zapping back uh, may not be as effective, but we'll find out. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, there's a question here, um, Bill, it's an honor, wondering if you have a pet theory of neurological mechanisms like neuroplasticity, et cetera, and um, Alexandra, who's the questioner, says, I know you're focused on the sub subjectivity, but she's curious about your theory around what's happening neuroscientifically, I guess, in the brain. Oh, my goodness. That is such an <laughs> incredible, exciting frontier. And, and yet, you know, we don't know what's going on in our brains right this minute. Yes. You know, much less under a psychedelic. Um, we, uh, you can dissect a lot of human brains and you can't find a person anywhere. You know, we really don't know what consciousness is yet, you know. And there's two basic uh, theories. You know, one is kind of the ghost in the machine, you know. Whatever the spiritual is, it comes in and animates the body. But the other is more the realm of quantum physics, that the ultimate nature of matter is energy, which perhaps is non-destructible, and that the uh, physicists are dealing with phenomena independent of time and space now, um, mind-boggling. Uh, the desk that we think is solid is really dancing subatomic particles, you know? <laughs> so there, there's a huge mystery. And, you know, we have these, it's like kindergarten, you know, uh, we have four crayons, you know? And we can say, well, we, we know that the default mode network in our brains, uh, which seems to be more active in everyday life, the functioning of the ego, you know, has less activity when these profound states of consciousness mm -hmm. are occurring. Well, well, that's helpful to know, you know, but correlation isn't necessarily causation. And uh, uh, for those who are excited about biochemistry and psychopharmacology, You've got my best wishes. It's a fascinating frontier. Um, I'm more of a philosopher myself, I guess. <laughs> I just no, we love uh, that about you. <laughs> no, we, we love the philosophy and we we love um, the sacred aspects that you're speaking to. Uh, there's a question here about what does turning off the intellect entail, and this goes again to to some of what you've been talking about, especially for consumers who understandably struggle with releasing control. So that's obviously something yeah. as we're more and more in a sort of mental world and mental structures, how yeah. do people transcend and let go of that need to be in control? Yeah, that's why taking a psychedelic in a trusting relationship and a confidential place is of critical importance. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not just being passive. It's choosing to relinquish control. It's like being on the high dive on a diving board and 
choosing to dive into the pool when you don't know what the temperature or the depth of the water is. Mm -hmm. That takes a lot of courage, you know? But if you know and trust your lifeguard, and you know that others have done it and said it was really worthwhile, you may choose to do it, okay? That comes much more easily to some people than others. And some people may need more time to develop a relationship, maybe some work with mental imagery uh, before they t try taking a psychedelic, you know, to begin what do you mean to by... explore their minds. Yeah. Okay, so what's what would that look like, for example, Bill, working on, on mental imagery? Yeah, that um, uh, without psychedelics, you would lie down, uh, close your eyes, maybe put on some headphones, and, and uh, imagine whatever landscape comes to you. Mm -hmm. And then explore kind of a waking dream. Enter into it, explore it, describe it. Uh, it's amazing how intense those experiences can become. And if you can allow yourself to essentially dream when you're awake, uh, that's good preparation for a psychedelic session. Mm -hmm. uh, comes much more easily to some people than others. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, that, that's very helpful. Scotty, did you have another question there that you wanted to um, ask? Yep. I do. There's one I'd like to pass to you. Um, this one comes from Lani, and I think this one's an absolute cracker. Um, Bill, do you think that human beings have an innate need for some kind of transcendental experiences to be fully healthy, either through meditation, prayer, breathwork, psychedelics, etc.? Depends on our definition of being fully healthy. <laughs> um, uh, mystics probably aren't uh, terribly concerned about uh, uh, becoming billionaires, and um, not, not that it's not wonderful that some people do. Um, what is the goal of life? We discover ourselves here in this little lifetime, in this incarnation. What do we do with it? The Buddhists talk about we're given one precious human life. Uh, what do we choose to do with it? What are our values? Um, what do we want to look back on when we're lying on our deathbeds? Um, pretty profound stuff. Mm. Uh, um, You know, the, I work a lot with cancer patients, uh, giving them psilocybin. And those who have these profound transcendental experiences usually report loss of a fear of death afterwards. It doesn't mean that they become suicidal. There's no desire to speed up the death. But they become... Uh, engaged in life again. They live until they die. They enjoy interpersonal relationships. They take their medications and eat well. And I think many of them live longer than uh, they expected to. Uh, and many of them would, they would not all say that there's a, uh, there may be many different forms of immortality, maybe not one size fits all, uh, but a sense that there is something that survives physical death, but there's no rush about it. They can approach it with curiosity, but the fear is gone. And, uh, you know, I hope the time will soon come when in Australia, for example, uh, the psilocybin will be available for use in palliative care in oncology centers as well. Uh, it might change the whole way we 
we live and approach death, which would be pretty dramatic. Hmm. Scotty, have you got another one there? Um, there are a couple of questions that have come in um, for your thoughts on microdosing. So perhaps um, I'm not sure if, that, if that's one you'd just like to share what your what your views are. Well, uh, I'm an expert in macro dosing. <laughs> Jim Fadiman is going to be speaking to you soon, I think. And he is the expert in micro dosing. So I'll let him uh, uh, teach you about that. Um, I honestly, personally, uh, don't know it. Many people who are doing it claim benefit. Uh, how you extract what's placebo effect and what's psychedelic effect is is challenging. Certainly doesn't seem to be harmful for them, you know? Hmm. Scotty, did you um have another question there that you wanted to ask Bill? Um, I'm just scrolling through. There is one one question that's come in about your thoughts, and this is obviously going to be something that's a long way down the road, um, that psilocybin might help children in a behaviour setting. Some of these children are extremely damaged. I've witnessed some terrible assaults and other horrible things. The current treatments at school are to dose the students so much that they become zombies. I've worked in these settings for over 10 years. Yeah, I think before these drugs are legalized uh, for general use, there probably will, I suspect the FDA will require uh, more research studies with adolescents and children. Uh, and um, that's been kind of a taboo area for um, most of us in the research world. We've uh, only taken volunteers 18 and above, but uh, I, it may well be that the careful use of psychedelics with younger people in a medical context might also be very helpful. You certainly have to build in a lot of support and uh, skill guidance, but uh, it, that's maybe some of you can do that research. It hasn't been, there were some studies uh, a few decades ago with children, uh, individual case studies in Europe and so on, before this became controversial. Um, can you believe there was a time when psychedelics were not controversial? Uh, when I started in Germany, uh, it was a perfectly reasonable thing to give psilocybin to a graduate student if he wrote a good report. <laughs> There's nothing controversial about it at all. <laughs> yeah. Well, those days are, are long gone. Yeah. It's so interesting too, though, Bill, just from that perspective of young people, because obviously in a lot of Indigenous cultures, these medicine experiences are used as a rite of passage for you know, someone likes or sort of like a bar mitzvah or bar mitzvah or, you know, when someone's around 13, 14 and so on, they, they take them into the jungle, the bush and and go on some very special experience like this. So it's interesting how we've lost touch with a lot of that ancient wisdom and, and there's so much more suffering as a result of that. Yeah, I, I often think that... And very young children, newborn up to one to two years of age, may spontaneously have states of consciousness very much like we uh, experience with psychedelics. But they don't have language yet and they can't talk about it. But I suspect some of them are not just seeing duckies and teddy bears. <laughs> they may well be looking at the dancing Shiva too. Yeah. Just by mm. speculation. No, no, I'm sure that's right. Um, Bill, did you want to reflect at all on um, how important it is for therapists of all different allied health backgrounds to learn these skills of psychedelic-assisted therapy, why that is important for them, not just to use psychedelic-assisted therapies, but why these skills are important for therapists in their overall practice as well?
Yeah. Um, it's wonderful to have permission to begin to use these medically, these, I call them sacred substances, uh, medically. Um, but it's critical that those who do in the helping professions uh, care for themselves, realize the potency of the therapeutic relationship uh, and have some uh, knowledge of how to teach people to benefit and what music to use. That's an area uh, Tanya and I enjoy exploring together. Uh, you can certainly have a powerful psychedelic experience in total silence. Music does not cause the content of an experience, but it can provide a nonverbal support that may enable people to go much more deeply within than they might otherwise be able to do and is uh, a very beautiful experience often in its own right. No, it's very important. I'm just looking at the other questions, sorry. Um, Hang on a second. Oh, yes. <clears throat> um, someone's talking about the importance of potentially looking at psychedelics for prevention and maintenance in the future. There's been quite a lot of talk about that in the chat, you know, that at the moment these medicines are only available to, quote, unquote, people with some kind of diagnosis, but really how important they are for attaining greater insights and wisdom and for prevention of more serious illness in the future and so on. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, my friend Bob Jesse talks about using psychedelics for the betterment of well people. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that may come in uh, retreat centers and um, where there can be responsible medical uh, screening and good preparation and skillful guidance and help in initial integration. But cultural change comes about gradually. And I let's be where we are right now to just begin to use it in treatment of depression and post-traumatic stress disorder legally, safely, hopefully, uh, Let's do that well. And step by step, if all goes well, they will uh, become used in a broader way. We have a study right now with MDMA at the Aquilino Cancer Center uh, where we give MDMA to the cancer patient, but also to a significant family member uh, who doesn't have cancer to enrich their relationship and their communication. And if that type of thing uh, continues to work well, it may not be so controversial to give a psychedelic, in this case MDMA, uh, to people who uh, do not have a DSM diagnosis. Yeah. But let's a little start. like um, that study Sorry to cut you off there. The ayahuasca study with the Palestinians and the Israelis that was being yes. worked on. Similar to that. And who knows what studies are waiting to be designed? And maybe some of you will design them, you know? Mm -hmm. We're always open the, to hearing about that. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're just at the beginning of an incredible frontier here, you mm -hmm. know? Let's just stay a question. grounded. Let's communicate well with one another. Uh, let's not scare the horses. Let's uh, communicate accurately, respectfully, scientifically with uh, those who are responsible for our laws and our guidelines in different countries. 
Um, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There's just a question here from um, Peter Nesbitt, but um, which is, do you think there are neuroplasticity benefits to brains from the use of psychedelics on their own for mental health? That I think he's saying without the integration part of Pat, or obviously the integration of the medicines is the most beneficial, which is why it's called psychedelic assisted therapies. Do you want to just comment, just, just, reiterate to everyone just how important that integration piece is that the medicine on its own whilst giving certain insights it's never going to be as as good as when you integrate fully and properly yeah well that that wonderful diagram behind your head tanya <laughs> it says it all you know <laughs> that within our brains within our psyches there are countless interconnections uh, and new alternative ways of uh, living, responding, understanding, relating. Um, and the psychedelics really do seem to uh, open up new pathways. Uh, and uh, some of the memories stay with you afterwards. It's not just a weird thing that happened one afternoon, but you, if the experience approaches the transcendental realms, it's, it feels more real than this reality does. And it stays with you. And it has, I think it carries with it a certain need to uh, apply the insights. Um, to be more creative, more courageous, more compassionate in the world. Mm. No, thank you. Um, <clears throat> there's people who are saying um, they'd love to have more webinars in this topic. Um, and I think just that these the discussions around consciousness, Bill, that you're, you know, that you speak about it are fascinating. And I'm always fascinated too by your discussions around meditation and psychedelics and religion and psychedelics and so on. And there's someone here who's saying we need to make you an honorary Australian citizen. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that lovely? <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. I would be honored. <laughs> but I no, am look, on we, we are on advisory board and I think I'm on a, I'm an advisor to mind medicine. So you are. I, I've already got my toe in Australia. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, you know, we're extraordinarily grateful, Bill. We're very honoured and um, just deep love and respect for you and, and everything that you share each time that you, you know, meet with us. And to all of you out there, um, if we can just put our hands together and, and give a huge little round of applause or put our hands up on the screen or whatever it is that you'd like to do um, to thank Bill. And um, Bill, we're very much looking forward to connecting further this year with CPAT, with, um, you know, other ways that we can, and I'm looking forward to some music sessions with you soon too. And um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, it's just beautiful to, to be, um, to be with you and to to learn from you uh, on this journey. So, you know, well, and, you and we, of course, acknowledge your dear colleague, Roland, who um, was one of our wonderful ambassadors and who has just been a, a dear friend to Mind Medicine Australia as well. It's pioneers like you that, you know, make us um, want to, to do this work because we stand on the shoulders of all of you. And of course, the desperate need in the community for healing is, is so immense. So thank you. Well, I'm very fond of the Indian namaste. Namaste. I honor the divine within each of you. Thank you, Bill. Let's, let's get into mischief together, okay? <laughs> Absolutely. All right, everyone. Well, thank you. And um, we look forward to seeing you on our next global webinar. And please do put your applications in for the CPAT course. And you can do like a whole three-hour session with Bill 
which people just rave about and is extraordinary. I've I've seen his wonderful teaching to the CPAT course and um, we encourage you to join and apply for that training. Thank you, Bill, and have a beautiful sleep tonight. And we you. hope we haven't kept you up for too long. <laughs> <laughs> have a good day. You too. Take care. <laughs>